Chapter 3 Daniel arrived back at the house he'd bolted from the night before. He held the key in front of the keyhole and paused. This is gonna be okay. You're gonna be okay. If he tries anything again, I can defend myself. If he has that knife again, I'll leave and call the police. I need to find out what's going on before I do anything else. He took a deep breath and stepped inside. The living room was eerily quiet. Leaving the front door open, Daniel peered up the stairs and listened for any signs of Laid's presence. Where is he? Did he leave last night too? What's going on? Can you help me make this bookcase, matey? Laith broke the silence, calling out from the kitchen. What? He's acting like nothing happened. Like I didn't run out of the house in my pajamas into the rain. Finally, Daniel spoke. Uh, okay. I don't have any instructions or anything, just these boards. Some are shelves, I guess, but I don't know what's a shelf and what's a wall. Laith stepped out of the kitchen, holding a number of wooden planks. He dropped them in the middle of the living room floor and smiled. Let's see how you handle this. Daniel stared at the pile of wood for a few moments, trying not to show how scared he still felt. Maybe everything is okay again? He seems normal. His physics brain started up. As he picked up the pieces in his mind and imagined slotting them into the correct configuration, or at least try and see what the thing was supposed to look like when, once it was built. It didn't look like a normal bookcase. The bottom shelf was wide, the top narrow, the middle one somewhere in between, like a pyramid with little feet to prop it up. The problem was none of the planks had any of the plugs to hold them all together. Ah, I've got some of those in my toolkit. Lathe left the room to fetch the plugs. Daniel continued to do science on the rubble, welcoming the distraction. After half an hour, Daniel had finally done it. A fully constructed and unusual looking pyramidal bookshelf, which they placed opposite the sofas and against the wall. You're so good at that kind of stuff, Daniel. Must be that physics brain you've got. I just can't seem to wrap my tiny little mind around things like that. Usually this kind of compliment would make Daniel feel good, competent and smart. But he didn't feel like that. He was suspicious. He thought about how often Lathe complimented him. Whether it's the clothes he wore, the decisions he made, or the abilities he had. The guy never criticizes me. It's almost like he says it for the effect, not because he actually means it. Daniel snuck upstairs at a suitable moment and opened his rarely used journal. If he wrote all this paranoia down, then he could try and make sense of it, see the patterns. If they existed, he wrote, Lathe gave me a weird compliment that felt like a sarcastic dig. Good, he thought, to have a piece of evidence. He didn't know what the evidence was for yet, but this was better than the confused and panicked state he was in when he left Sam's house in the morning. This was like he was a detective, trying to determine a suspect's guilt for an unknown crime. He was starting to feel like he had a handle on it. Okay, sure, he still felt like last night was messed up, but maybe he was blowing things out of proportion. Lathe wasn't talking about it. Neither should he, for now. He decided to carry on for the time being, like nothing had happened. Building furniture and unpacking just like he had planned. Staying observant and careful, but otherwise getting on with it. When Lathe offered him a joint, he declined and grabbed a beer instead. Best to keep as sober as possible, he reasoned to himself. Lathe looked disappointed, but didn't push it. They had a long conversation about politics and everything seemed normal again. At least until Lathe insisted that they watch a film. A film named Conspiracy. The film was about Nazis, a small group of officers conspiring to find a final solution to the Jewish problem that they saw in 1930s Germany. It was a dialogue-heavy film set in one room, much like the classic Twelve Angry Men. Watching on Lathe's widescreen TV with a full surround sound, Daniel couldn't relax. Why had Lathe chosen this film, with that name, on this day? He couldn't shake the idea that Lathe was not who he seemed, that he had ulterior motives, potentially life-threatening ones. It didn't make sense, rationally, but deep in his gut, he knew. He kept drifting off in thought and found it impossible to keep up with the dialogue or follow the plot. 
He knew he needed to pay attention to what the film was about to figure out why Lathe had chosen it. But indecision about what to do with all of this craziness was an inescapable magnet for his focus. What do you think about that then? Lathe asked after a dramatic exchange between two of the movie's characters. Totally lost, Daniel just said, great scene, pretending he was intensely interested in the next one. Lathe looked at him with a quizzical expression and then chuckled to himself. Why is he laughing? Does he know that I wasn't listening and is making fun of me? Daniel thought back to when they were last in York together three years ago. They would often watch cartoons in Lathe's flat. On more than one occasion, Lathe would randomly laugh. Daniel would instinctively laugh back. When Lathe would ask him what he was laughing at, Dan Daniel wouldn't know what to say, usually because he hadn't been paying attention. He'd freeze up, then let out a nervous laugh again. Lathe would chuckle in the same way he just did. He'd been acting like that for years, but Daniel hadn't thought much of it. Now though, he wondered. It's important to know what words mean. Daniel's ears perked up as one of the German officers started his arguments. Those words last night just wouldn't leave him alone. Trying to right a wrong. A few days passed and Daniel found comfort in his work. Bringing food to strangers always brought him a sense of calm in times of stress. He'd get into uniform, have simple and easy conversations with strangers who he mostly never saw again. Plus, he'd get to see them enjoying the fine food he'd served. The pace of the work was so fast that he didn't have much time to ponder the nature of life, what went wrong with his business, or what the hell is going on with Lathe. Ideal for an overactive physics mind to take a break in. The physical strain was demanding, especially during the long 12-hour shifts he sometimes had to do. But he liked it. It was like a free gym, kept his blood pumping and body moving. It gave him a feeling of being alive that can't be found while confined to a desk and swivel chair. He'd been waiting tables back in London after his business had fallen apart. It took a few nights living in a tent, unable to afford bread before he finally gave up and got a regular job. He'd been a waiter while at university, so it was an easy interview. That job earned him a single bed in a tiny room in South London. For a year, he shared the apartment with four Eastern Europeans who had regular cocaine parties until 6 a.m. Daniel wasn't the partying type, preferring a quiet chat with weed to a buzzed and frantic night on cocaine. Compared to that living arrangement, this three-bedroom house in York was a quiet country mansion. But what was a step up for Daniel was in part a step down for Lathe. He had spent the last three years in the seaside town of Great Yarmouth, a resort town with long sandy beaches, far to the south of York in the county of Norfolk. Lade's flat there was small and grubby, but he loved the place. Full of arcades, great seafood, and a buzzing summer atmosphere, he was sad to have left it for the dreary and cynical north. But he'd had no choice. His debts had piled up and the bailiffs were at the door. That's when he called Daniel to ask for help. With no money of his own to settle the debt, Daniel offered the only thing he could, an escape route. Just two days before that call, Daniel had decided to leave London for the cheaper rent and familiar ground of his university town, York. In the spur of the moment, he took the lead on creating a plan of action to save his friend from ruin. First, he would hire a van that same day, drive to Great Yarmouth and stash Lade's most valuable possessions in a self-storage unit that the bailiffs couldn't find. Second, he would drive the four hours up to York and find a place for them both to live, then sign the 12-month lease, paying the deposit and first month's rent himself. Finally, he would drive back to Great Yarmouth, grab the gear out of the storage, pick up Lathe and return to York for their fresh start together. The plan hinged on Lathe finding a job in York within the first two months, a hinge that no one was pessimistic about. He had never had an interview that didn't lead to an immediate job offer and had 10 years of solid work experience in restaurants, bars and even factories. Daniel had managed to get a transfer for himself at the restaurant chain he waited for so his own employment in York was secure. He'd worked out that he could pay the full rent and bills for the first two months. He could afford to keep paying Lathe's share for longer if he had to, but didn't tell Lathe that. Ever since that first night in the house, he felt he couldn't trust Lathe with the truth. Worse, he couldn't shake the feeling that Lathe was actually very dangerous, that his own life was at risk. 
He might have been able to escape it all while serving food to strangers, but he couldn't avoid it when home. Hoping that time would bring answers, he focused on the work and tried to minimize contact with Lathe for the time being. On the fourth day after the move, Daniel initiated an unavoidable conversation about money, how they were going to manage grocery staples like milk and eggs. Living together meant certain things would be shared, and Daniel wanted to make sure that it wouldn't be him that was the only one who was buying. Look, matey, Lathe argued, I can't be bothered with grocery funds or tracking receipts and all that. If we need stuff, we'll just buy it and assume that we each put in the same amount in. No need to turn it into some sort of contract, but whatever you want, I'll happily chip in however many quid it is you want in the pot per week, if that's what you want. So wait, are you saying you do want a weekly pot that we both chip in for, or you don't? I'm saying I don't think any sort of contract is needed. So you don't think we should? Look, you just do what you think is best. Daniel liked order. He valued structure and mutually beneficial agreements that were clear and well-defined. It grated on him that Lathe was being so fleeting. The conversation ended there, and for the next few days, Daniel bought things whenever he needed them. As expected, it was him and only him who bought the groceries. It was not only him who was eating said groceries. Can you chip in 10 pounds, please? We got through a lot of food last week and I did all the shopping, Daniel asked one day as he unloaded a bag of supermarket ready meals and pasta one pots. Yeah, sure, I'll just go get it from the bank tomorrow. I think there's still money in there. I mean, I did buy those three bottles of wine this week, but if you feel you need some money back for bread, then of course, matey. Daniel had seen the wine, but had thought it best to not go near intoxicants of any kind. Well, I didn't drink any of the wine you bought, so that was more of a you thing rather than a communal thing. He half expected the man to leap across the room and strangle him for refusing to forgive a ten pound grocery debt. Fine, fine, but listen, Daniel, it's weird that you're not drinking anymore. I used to love chilling with you and some beers, talking some bullshit and playing Xbox, but you've been distracted lately. What's going on? Daniel thought about how much Lathe had encouraged him to drink over the years. When Daniel was three months into his ketamine sobriety, it had been Lathe who'd introduced him to whiskey, a vice that gradually took ketamine's place as Daniel's go-to escape drug when life got too stressful and business started going wrong. He'd never put it together. Lathe had always told him how great whiskey was and how relaxing it was to have a glass or a bottle after a long day. During his darkest moments when his clients had vanished and he was forced to live in that tent, defecating in plastic bags on occasions when nature's call was too loud to muffle, whiskey became part of his identity. Not a day went by without countless glasses being drunk neat, often until he passed out. Now here he was, trying to stay away from the booze and met with someone he thought was his friend, trying to convince him to put up, pick up the bottle again. Does Lathe want me to be an addict? He wondered. Daniel decided to stand his ground. Look, I've had a problem with booze in the past, you know that. I don't want this return to York to be tainted by that past. Fine, drink, don't drink, that's fine with me if you don't want to share a beer with your best friend who crossed the country to come back to this hellhole and help you put your life together. The sarcasm was coming up more and more these last few days. I rescued you, Lays. don't you remember? The bailiffs were at your door and you called me in a panic asking for help. I never asked you to uproot my whole life and drag me back to York. I could have dealt with the bailiffs, but you gave such a good speech about how much better life would be if we were back together. And you're the smartest man I know, so of course I gave you a chance, but it hasn't felt great yet, matey. Daniel decided he didn't want to antagonize the man until he knew more, so he didn't challenge the blatant lie that Lathe hadn't asked to come back to York with him. What's the problem? You don't like the house? The house is fine, a bit crumbly around the edges, but you found a great place. The neighbors aren't exactly the type to bring a welcome to the area cake, but whatever. Then what is it? Daniel asked as gently as he could, predicting that the answer would be laden with more snide attacks. You, you go off to work and then sit in your room all evening. I barely get to hang out with you anymore. You won't even share a beer with me. 
I'm stuck here all day sitting on my hands and I can't even afford to buy groceries. I feel like a failure. You're not a failure, Daniel instinctively replied. You just need time to get yourself sorted. You know, get a job, find a girl. As soon as he'd said it, he realized that Lathe had just turned a conversation about grocery money into his own sob story. Have you been applying for jobs? He asked, trying to bring the focus back to the issue at hand. Yes, I've sent out a bunch of emails, but no one's replying. There's too many students in this town and I'm too old to apply for entry level work. Still, you're not looking for your next career. You just need a job that pays enough to cover rent and bills until you figure out what you want to do. Daniel had fallen back into comforting friend mode, so quickly corrected course. I can't pay the bills longer than a month or two, and I've already spent shitloads on the money for the deposit for the house and the estate agent's fees. It was like two grand, mate. And the plan was you'd pay me back once you got a job. Yes, Daniel, I really appreciate all you've done and all the money you've spent. Of course, I want to pay you back in full as soon as possible, but that's a long way off. I thought you, of all people, understood that. You promised you'd pay it back within the first few months. And you promised there'd be lots of jobs up here. This was going nowhere. Daniel felt guilty that Lathe wasn't finding work like he'd hoped. But in the back of his mind, he didn't believe that Lathe was even applying. When he was home, he only saw Lathe smoking weed and playing Xbox. When he was out, he had no way of knowing what Lathe was up to. Earlier in the day, Daniel had looked at the local job boards and seen dozens of recent posts from positions ranging from entry level to middle management, all of which Lathe could easily walk into. Anyway, Lathe sighed. I'm gonna have a joint. Care to join me? No thanks, I have to get up early. For all he knew, the second he got high, Lathe would pull that knife out again. He'd escaped the first time, not worth the risk for a second. Right, Lathe slumped his shoulders. Daniel watched him sullenly walk to the conservatory, as if a child trying to get a response from a parent. His curiosity too compelling to avoid, he followed him into the conservatory and lit a cigarette, while Lathe started his joint. There were bigger things to worry about now than a bit of tobacco smoke jeopardizing his deposit. A single loud drop of rain landed on the conservatory roof, which consisted of four beams laid from each corner to the center of the room, rising to form a pyramid. A second drop followed, then a third and fourth. Seconds later, the next hundred drops landed in unison. Thunder rolled in from afar, vibrating the walls as it let the world know that a storm was coming. Daniel looked up and watched the rain flowing down the sloped glass roof. The torrent was deafening as it crashed onto the thin ceiling. He tried to lighten the mood. The rain sounds pretty cool in here, like we're in a tent or out in the wilderness or something. Lathe took a deep pull on his joint, then cleared his throat. <clears throat> yeah, you think it's bad now? You wait till the real storm sets in. All right, thank you for listening. That was chapter three of Time Not Here, my first novel. It's available on Amazon. I would love to hear your thoughts, your feelings, any inspiration or any kind of resonance that you had with this story. Um, chapter four is coming up next. It, chapter four is probably one of my favorite chapters. I love the opening paragraph. I think I just nailed it, but you can be the judge of that for your own enjoyment of the book, but I will see you there. Thank you very much. Take care of yourself, take care of your family. I'll see you again soon. Bye-bye.